So first, when you go ahead and decide what you want to develop on, um, you need to just pick your different board, your different um, developer board to do your customizations. And you, in doing that, you need to understand whether it is a commercial device, so you, you can take a commercial device if you're doing application work, um, whether it's a buttoned up platform where you want to do your power profiling, or whether you want an entirely open board here, such as a dragon board, where you can add on your different hardware components, and there's other boards like this. So today, as I mentioned, I'm going to discuss the dragon board. So what is this? It's a thoroughly exposed board where you have access to all the hardware components. Um, and again, here are the specs for it, but I think you're more interested on how to use this board, right? Everyone's interested on how to, how to build the Android for it. How do I modify the Android kernel? How do I first find the source code and interact with it? So this is our APQ8060. It's a dual core 1.5 gigahertz processor. And today I'm gonna to show you how to use the board. So first, where do you find the software? So someone puts this board on your desk and you go, I wanna build the Android for it, or I wanna build, you know, modify the Linux kernel. How do you go about finding that information? So Qualcomm, through Qualcomm Innovation Center, is one of the founders and contributors to Coderoa Forum. This is where the source code is hosted, and I'm one of the, um, the users here, the registered users of Coderoa. And so I'm gonna tell you about the Android project. So I've already loaded it up here. So you'll click on the Android project, you can access the forums, you can ask some questions, get some information. You can go to the wiki page, which is what I'll show you next, um, and then you'll, you can bounce out to the Git location to download all the source code projects uh, and different patches. So this is the wiki page when you first launch the page. I'm going to scroll down here to the bottom to give you the repo command that you'll use, and you'll seed it with a different branch depending on your different chipset architecture. So you'll see here we've got ice cream sandwich for uh, all of these different targets here. Um, we've got different branches uh, for each of these. And then what we currently have here on the APQ8060 that vSquare is, is shipping with is the Gingerbread OS. And uh, in the future, there'll be updates uh, as they become available. So for the Gingerbread, we're going to look. It's the MSM8660. So that's our branch that we're going to use. And then we're also going to apply some patches on top of this. So just looking here at the Git projects, we've got all of the different um, Get projects, and we're going to use the repo command to check this out. So I'm going to bounce over here. So this is on my Linux machine, and what I'm going to do is start to check out the source code. So like I said, we're going to download the Gingerbread OS. So I'm going to pull down the Gingerbread software and set this all up. So it's going to pull down a default manifest. Now, for this release, there's a so for this release, there's a manifest um, that B-Square would provide or, or the other manufacturer of the board um, when you were to receive it. You can get uh, different tags for the different, um, different projects so that you check out the exact same source code that you have on your device so that you can modify it, make all your changes, and make sure it has compatibility in the user space as well as down on the kernel level. So now that I've checked it all out, you can see I've got my uh, Code Aurora account here. So I'm going to go ahead and replace manifest file. And then I can do a repo sync and I can pull down all the software. So I'll go ahead and start this. Now this takes some time um, depending on your system and you can also pass in a command to thread it. So I'm just going to go ahead and stop this and I've already checked out everything here on this cath build. So this is the entire source that I've just synced. Um, everything's been checked out so for time, we've got it right now. Now one of the next steps on here is that there's a few patches for audio that you're going to want to apply so that you still have that same functionality when you rebuild. So back to what I was talking about on uh, Code Aurora here, um, we've got a different patch section. So if you came from the, uh, Linux, or the Android page and you clicked on patches, you would land on this interface. And so you could search this and find various different patches. And if we look for APQ, we've got this tarball right here that I'm going to go ahead and download. So we'll bounce back here. We're going to go ahead and pull this down and uh, then apply it. <coughs> so I've downloaded it. And now I'm going to extract it. And then I'm going to go into the kernel. <coughs> and we're going to apply all these patches. And 
unless it's slow. And there we go. All right, so now there's a couple other modules we're going to go ahead here and update. Um, there's device QCOM. And again, we're targeting the 8660 surf here, so that's going to be our target. And now we're set to go ahead and build here. If we wanted to apply a couple others for the, uh, the charging configuration so that you can have that by default when you um, unplug the battery here, then the board's just going, so you can apply that patch. Um, but we'll just keep it right now to the kernel for what we have. So the next thing that we're going to do here is we want to go in and configure our kernel. Um, so you can go and go, you would be able to make all your modifications, you can go ahead and set everything up. And you might not want to build the entire Android OS. You want to build just the boot image. So just for time sake, I've got one here that's already built. And so one of the important things when you check this all out is that there's certain tools um, to build your boot image for the correct page size and everything. And you can go find that information out, or you can just use the tools that are right here, the project that you downloaded. So it's perfectly capable of downloading just the kernel itself and rebuilding it using the proper commands and tools, or you can use the built-in scripts. So to do that, what we're first going to do is load up using source build environment setup. And then we're going to make sure we choose the right target to set up some symbolic links and variables. So this will take a little bit here. So we're going to choose the device as this sets up some things. And if there's any questions, please raise your hand and we'll try to answer them along the way. So give us some time here. We're going to choose the release version. Um, that's just the tool that, that I use on this. You could use something similar. This is just going to be built up. You'll see here on the next step where it's got all the different device targets. Um, and that's just the system that we use. So if you're more comfortable using your kernel and configuring it that way um, and setting up the board config files, you can go ahead and use that environment. So now I'm going to go ahead and choose MSM8660 surf. So now we're all set up for the environment. If I issued right here a make-j for my number of processor, it will build the entire Android stack. But I want to build just the kernel so that we can load that over and then we can test it on the device. Um, and this is where you would go ahead and go in and make your modifications, include your Linux drivers, um, compile it all into the system, and you would use make uh, menu config, set up your entire environment, and build out your new kernel. So let's assume that I've added some new hardware here made some changes to the kernel, and we're going to go ahead and test our implementation. So we're going to do a make um, kernel, and j4. And so this is going to go ahead and build, and as the output of this, we'll have a boot image that we can flash right on the device, and it'll execute, and we can load it up. So as this is compiling, um, has anyone reviewed the board or is familiar with the board? I know I was out there showing it off uh, earlier today, and I know a couple of you came by and saw it and were pretty interested in it. So. Have one. You have one? What are your experiences? Are you enjoying it? No, I haven't had a chance to bring it up yet. I've learned enough here that I'll be able to. Got it, right. So this, this is one of the big ways right now. I'm sure that maybe the board came out and you weren't sure where do I get the Android source, how do I compile it, where do I get the right software from. So using these steps, you're going to be able to get the entire instructions. Now, there, there are, will be updates to the OS, so we'll be in the future coming out with an ICS. That'll be one of our next releases. Um, and as new boards come out, we'll start legacy off, um, support. But you'll be able to take that board and contact uh, vSquare, which is the supplier of this, and they'll give you the correct build instruction. Or you can go and look in on CAF there, um, just as I just showed you, and you'll be able to find the correct information and start downloading your source code. One thing I saw in the documentation was some sort of a warning not to to rebuild and reflash the AMMC image, that there were some pieces that would be missing. 
Is that not current anymore? Is it yeah, so there is some proprietary software in the device, and that's what I'm going to get into in a little bit. Um, but just real quick, so in the user space, it says proprietary software. If you're going to modify that with the open source components, instead of flashing your entire system image, just use the ADD push command. So for instance, if you were modifying the, the um, uh, web tech engine, and you wanted to change that, just ADD push lib web port to the uh, system lib folder. So that way you can maintain compatibility. You'll still have a functioning camera, as well as your Wi-Fi and everything else on the board. Is there yeah, so right now on B Squared's website, if you went to it, download in their docs and downloads. So when you purchase the device, they have a download section. Um, I don't really want to get into so much on their product <coughs> or their system, but you would go ahead and log in, you'd register with your serial number and the email that was used to um, purchase the device, and then you'd have access to the update that they have up there, which is the latest software, so you can reflash that. Um, and then there's also some documentation for the schematics. So if you wanted to make these hardware modifications, you can look at the schematics, you can make all the changes. Um, and then, I know it's kind of a little hard to see, but this is the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth card. So maybe we'll go into a little bit of the hardware here. This can be popped off. You get schematics for this if you wanted to change up the parts. We also have a sensor board. Um, now everything you see right here all comes with the device. Um, oops, took a picture of this camera. Um, so this, this goes for without the camera um, and the display as well as the, uh, the audio headset, that'll go for $299. And then with everything, it goes for $500 for the entire package you see here. Uh, again, it's a 1.5 gigahertz dual core. There's no modem on this device. So again, not trying to sell the device or anything, just trying to inform you about it. So as you can see here, we've got our um, boot image that's been created. And I've already copied over this exact same image right here. And now I'm going to get the device into fast mode. So there's two ways you can do this. If it's already booted up into the OS, you can issue an ADB command. Um, so we'll go ahead and do that right now. Now it's my preference to always use the minus sign because sometimes I type fast and misspell bootloader and it just reboots the device. So that's one little tiny trick that I use. So this is one way to boot it up, but let's say that you've somehow flashed a corrupted image to the device and it's not booting up into anything. You want to bring it up into fast boot mode. So just like other devices, there's an actual way to do this with the hardware key. So I'll just show you here it's in fast boot mode. And what I'm going to do now is completely power down the board. And when I plug it back in here, I'm going to hold the 5 button and turn it back on. And that's going to boot it up into fast boot mode. So through the physical five button, that's how you enter fast boot. So if you somehow corrupt your, your kernel, corrupt some of the stuff, and you don't do a one-time flash, then you have the ability to get back into your system and reflash the partitions. Uh, and then if you're curious, recovery mode is if you hold the four key. So you have the ability to put something on the MMC and then restore it through those means. So right now I have my device. Now one of the important things is once I've modified the kernel and I've made some changes, I want to test it first because maybe we have other developers using this board and you want to be able to bring it back up after if your, your kernel's corrupted. So we issue the fast boot boot. So we're going to go ahead and do a boot of the boot image. And you'll see here that it's loaded up. Uh, the screen's powered on. And we're going to see the Android logo here in a second. It's working, which it should be. So there's the Android logo. So my kernel's built correctly. It's powering up the device. And we're all set to go ahead and now go back into the system, make our modifications, and really start to build out our whole environment. So again, you also have access to the entire schematics. Um, so you can make all your hardware changes. There's a MIPI display um, that we're in the process of producing an app note for. So lots of people want to go ahead and change this display out and make that modification. Um, and so we're helping to provide some documentation around these big features that we see people trying to make to really help drive the ecosystem here and really promote the uh, development environment. <coughs> so, are there any kind of questions about the build process or just that setup right now? Ah, okay. Sure. Yeah, so this is actually 2.3.5 from the gingerbread. Um, so, I'll go back over here to tag. So I actually jam, uh, downloaded the gingerbread mainline. Um, and so you can see there's various other tags here. Um, and it's always continuously updating and pushing out to the system. 
So you'd look either for the 8660 tag, um, which was last pushed out. Uh, How long does that usually take to build? Sorry, to pull down the source code? When you pull it down, I mean, how long does it take to build? Uh, it depends on your environment. Um, so if you're building gingerbread and you've got a, a quad core CPU, it's about an hour, 15 hour, 10 minutes. Uh, if it's ice cream sandwich and you're building that, it takes a little bit longer. Um, so it, it all depends on your build setup. So whatever hardware you're compiling on. So you can use either one of these tags, but I would recommend talking to B-Square and they can provide you with the version XML and you'll just be able to pull down the exact tags that was used in, on the board when it shipped. So that's kind of going ahead and building up your product. So now at the next stage you've gone through, you've built this all out, you've made some changes, and you want to now go ahead and profile your system. Which leads me to the next part here of the presentation is, how do you take your device and find battery bottlenecks? Right? And what I mean by that is we've, we've modified Android in some way. We want to ensure that we haven't introduced any inefficiencies or we're not consuming any extra power than what's needed. So you can hook up some additional tools. Um, there's a, a Hoplite or a Spartan, some other type of uh, third-party pro um, products that you can attach to the board, monitor the overall power drain. And what I'm going to talk about right now is the exact same technology you see here on this board is on what we call our Snapdragon MVP. And the reason I bring this up is because this hardware has dedicated circuitry that sits on the power rails. And so we have a tool called Trepan Profiler. And so this is going to allow you to profile the entire system or to go ahead and profile your single application you're developing. So you can understand really at a hardware level what's happening, what's changing, um, what have you introduced on extra um, consumption for new modules. So I've got the app here, and before we run it, I'm going to go ahead and show you the UI elements that you're going to see. So Trepin runs on the device on the application processor, and it's reading different data points. So, it, and when you begin profiling, it's going to start in the background. <clears throat> so, like I mentioned, we have embedded power sensors, analog to digital converters that sit in between each of these hardware. So, it's the same type of technology you have on the board. You can load over the same image, uh, make some minor modifications, load it up on this, this device, and you'd go out to CAF and you'd rebuild the image in the exact same manner. So, you can go ahead and monitor both the cores uh, for the dual core system, uh, the Adreno GPU, so if you're making graphics changes, um, some tau, uh, having an application that's really driving the CPU and the GPU, you can go ahead and tune those variables and really find out what's happening. So we have all these different stat metrics here that you can choose from, um, such as the power rails. And one thing I want to add is this application is also available on developer.qualcom.com, and it runs on commercial products. But when you run it on a commercial product, you're not going to get the power readings because the hardware isn't set up to establish them. So you'll be able to get the system stats, the network stats, as well as some CPU usage. So it gives you a very powerful tool just on your existing platform to monitor on the device top and other types of uh, certain things for your CPU usage, see what applications are taking up some uh, different resources. So this is once you've profiled your app, you're going to see this graph. We've got a legend that slides out. I'll go ahead and show you this interacting. Um, but I just want you to kind of get an idea of what the UI is that you're going to see with these different graphs. So we've got the power measurements on the left side in um, milliwatts over time. <coughs> and we've got this little uh, um, gap over here from the minus 5 to 0, which is kind of our baseline. So what's happening on the system before we started profiling. So here it is on the stat side. So we have the ability to look at that baseline that I just mentioned, analyze the system at the current time, and then be able to see what's happening as the system progresses um, from the start time to whenever we stop profiling. Now, <coughs> interesting graphic, I know. Um, but this is from uh, one of our games, and we're analyzing here, and there's overlays. So say, for instance, you've got, this is not just a game, maybe it's your OS <coughs> modified. So you can have overlays that tell you how much the cores are interacting, what's changing in the system for CPU frequencies, um, what the digital core power is, what the overall drain is of power. So throughout your application design, you'll be able to see these overlays if you turn them on. You can also customize the readings. So as I mentioned, you can go ahead here and look at some different things for the uh, per app stats. So you can see the, the CPU usage. And then there's one other thing that I'm going to show you here. That's a trick that I do. So there's an advanced usage. So as I mentioned, you can download from 
uh, developer on Qualcomm.com and just install it on a device. But there's an advanced usage where you can set markers at different intervals. Now you can either modify this in your code, but since most of us here are probably doing some Android work or kind of modifying the OS in some way, we're going to use a laptop and I'm going to send ADB commands to invoke intents to set markers so we'll be able to see different app states. And so what we're going to show next here is a live demonstration. Back over to this here. All right. So it's actually a little small, but once we start rotating. So this is the app as I started it up. Um, and what I'm going to do here is keep refreshing this so you can see this and I can really talk and uh, ex explain what's going on. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, start. Oops. So I'm going to go ahead and profile an app. And so this screen pops up here. Let's get it to refresh. And what we're going to do is analyze the camera. So now it's going to set up, it's going to do some background information, create that baseline of five seconds. And then we've got the camera that's gone, gone ahead and started here. So you can see we've got kind of this overlay in the bottom corner. And I'll refresh this, bear with me when it rotates. Um, so you can see we've got here my own custom overlay. So much like we had with the, the image that I showed with that, the, the person from the um, game, we've got up here our CPU power. And then we've got down here the digital camera power, so you can see it fluctuating as the camera is being used. And I'm also monitoring the SD card. So this would be maybe in my app, I'm logging a bunch of information in the file system, and I can analyze that and I can see where can I be more efficient? What if I write in big chunks? Will that, will that save power over time? So you'll be able to get all that information. So I'm going to do one thing here real quick. have an ADB command here that I can execute. And so I can use this right here to set an intent, which is then going to be able to track my instances in the app. So we're just going to go ahead and send this intent here, and I'll refresh it. And you'll see that nothing's really changed except for in our graph later, there'll be a marker. So I'm going to go ahead and capture an image. <coughs> and you're not going to see the image here, unfortunately. But if I refresh this, you're going to be able to see that the card here is changed and had different power readings. So we're going to set another intent here, and that's going to set our marker so when we look at the graph, we'll accurately know for certainty that the camera snapshot happened in between this time interval. So you can also see, when we analyze this, you can look at my cursor here, the core power has gone ahead and changed. So because we've captured the image, different things in, in the application processor started up, it's captured the image, it's uh, copied some memory buffers, and then it's saved it to the SD card. So you can see there's a big spike here when it's writing to the, to the SD card and saving that information out. So we're going to exit back out of this. We're going to stop profiling. And then we're going to look at the graph. And so there's a lot of information here. And if I bring out the slider, we can see here we've got all the dual core power. We've got the um, digital power from the camera as well as the analog, so you can see it's pretty steady the entire way. And then as we break this down and look at the application state, we'll be able to see those instances where you can see some spikes in power. So I'm going to turn off these here. I'm going to leave on the core power. So what we've got here, and you can see right here there was a state jump where it changed for the first part. So this is where we first took the camera, and you can see all the activity in the app processor that happened. So for instance, maybe if this was just your default OS as you were profiling it, maybe you had some new connected environment, um, or maybe this was your driver, you can see how much it's consuming from the app processor as it's going ahead and calculating all these new instructions. Um, and then you'll see right here, this is when it finished, and the application state's changed. It's a little hard to see underneath there. So let me turn these off real quick. So you can see there was the state change. And now what we're going to do is overlay the camera power on top of this with the SD card. And you can go ahead and see here the big state change. So this was right when the camera started up. You can see that so the SD card had some activity because it's loading in the background and doing some things. Then it's pretty much idle. And then we went ahead and we captured the image. 
and then here's a big spike in power. So you could use something similar like this. Um, you can see here all the camera different state change where the, the analog has gone ahead and stopped, captured the actual image, and then started back up. The same thing for when we exited the app. So using this tool, you can not only profile your application, but more importantly, you can profile the entire system. So if you've made some changes or optimizations, you can really look at this, benchmark it, and then come back and find the power readings and find the different stats. So if we can look at one more thing here. We're going to look at just how much power we consumed. And we've got our different states. Let me scroll a little down here. So you can see it at our um, baseline, so on our state zero, um, which was right before we captured, um, we were consuming 71 uh, milliwatts of power on average. And then after we've captured it, you can see that it spiked there, came up some. And if we scroll back down, you'll see here at the end, we've gone ahead and, and lost some power. And you can see there was a spike as well at the very bottom of the screen here. So we can see the 52 on average is once it started to capture that information. So this is just one way that you can use this tool to really look at how you can profile your, your entire system. Um, and so the other, again, it's only on this device. If you use it on um, commercial devices or even on the dragon board here, you'd have to manually set and monitor each of the components in between each of these. So it gives you just a, a snapshot of what you can do in your system. Yes, sir? Okay. Now that I know um, that my camera app is taking this much power, what can I do about it? Right. So, so the camera app right there, it, this was just an example so you could see what's, what's going on. So if in your new component or your new change what you've made to your system, you'll be able to dive into the code and maybe it's more that you still have logging turned on or you're writing the file system. So it really depends on what type of application you're developing. Um, on how you analyze that and use that information. It could be that it's already optimized, and you're using it as a proof point to say this is as efficient as I can get. So uh, I think uh, dig down and dig down and these are the hot spots in the code and uh, exactly. So you'll be able to note the hot areas. Can I does the profiler allow me to do that? Dig down and say this function, this function that's taking this much. Uh, this causing yeah. So 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 there's two ways to that. You can do what I was manually doing with the intent. In instruction and you could then drill down into your application you know where the spikes are because you've seen it it's with an IO right right for instance maybe you're looking at the file system on how you're writing you can go ahead and say before my write I'm going to go ahead and send a command and then I'm going to set another state right after I'm going to see exactly what instruction it is that's taking so much power so using that you can take and go drill into the code itself and start to in instrument different points so um your yeah, profiler has the, has the hooks for me to consume uh, my code for. Exactly. Yeah, so let me back up here so you can see this. So, so this slide right here, um, if this was an Android app, you could issue it this way. Uh, but you could also do an executable instruction, as I was doing, uh, and execute this out so that it will send those markers and those intents so that when you look at the graph and analyze it, you also have the ability to export this to um, an Excel spreadsheet. Once you save it out, it'll be on the SD card. You can save the log, pull it off, and reread re all this information. So you can really drill down into exactly what it is that's consuming a lot of power. But you do have to do some legwork. It's not going to go ahead and look at your code and analyze and say, this line of code is executing this much power. But you'll be able to, to be able to determine those areas. So this, is, this is basically a power profiler. Exactly. Okay. So we also have a performance profiler available. Um, so there, there are some things you can do on performance um, within the app here. So if we're profiling the entire system, so if I'm just looking at the system as a whole, we can basically see top command. So you'll be able to know what processes are currently running. Um, we can then drill into those processes and we'll be able to get different information on what, how much memory is being used, um, it's RAM and everything else. So you'll be able to determine what apps are hogging your system. So it could be that you've taken your hardware, you've then customized your Android stack, you've created these brand new applications that are always running and connected, and now you want to go ahead and optimize those. So you can take all your development efforts that you've done on this open board, you can load the exact same kernel onto here um, once it's uh, synchronized up, you can boot that up, and then you can analyze your different changes. 
you'll be able to look at it and really try to understand what's happening. And it could be back to the very beginning that I was talking about, either of these developer boards, you really need to think what your end goal is. If it's just doing Android OS, maybe this device right here is perfect for you. If you're doing some hardware customizations, then you want to look at what you're doing for your end product and really focus on that type of board and really drill into that technology. I think there was a question over here. Um, so, so that's up to the, the open source code that you have, right? So you can instrument it just as I was showing here with these intents, and you can send after every instruction, you can send a breakpoint, change the state. But it's also, I mean, in terms of the sampling rate for the actual, I mean, you can see it in terms of what's instrumented in the device, and that's what I was wondering what the limit was. Yes, I don't know that limit off the top of my head, um, but if you set six data points is what it takes every... Is it every every few milliseconds? It's, it captures six instructions or six data points. So if you have more than six data points, then you're going to get some synchronization issues. So you really want to look at the stats that you're profiling. Um, and then on our la latest chipsets, our MVP that will be coming out soon, there's actually even more power rails that you can monitor. So your GPU, for instance, you'll be able to, or sorry, your GPS, you'll be able to monitor that. That's not on this device. But you can do the camera, your your I/O writes. Uh, as well as um, some of the other data points that I showed. Yes, sir? Do you have any idea what the, the power overhead is to run these communications? Uh, it, it's very negligible, right? So it's just running as the application processor. It's just reading some values. Um, it's, it's not a lot. You can see just when this is running right here right now, um, it's consuming because it's at the forefront. But when it's in the background, it's hard to see when it's in the background because um, the app has to profile itself. Uh, but you'll be able to see that it, it's using just a negligible part. That's the, one of the big things about the baseline, is when the app's running, it takes a snapshot of the current state, and then it adjusts the values from there on, so you can really see the difference between when you started and when you've gone ahead and gone. Yes, sir? I'm not sure if I, if I got this earlier or not. Is there a programmable way, of, a procedural way of, of being able to, to define what you put on? Yeah, so, so let me go here to the settings. Um, we've got some questions on this. Um, there's not an API that's exposed uh, to set those different markers. There's uh, a call that we have here with uh, a broadcast intent to be able to set the breakpoints so your app state changes so you can analyze what's happening before. So maybe it's right before a network call and you're looking at your network traffic to make sure you're efficient, right? You're not causing a lot of network traffic. Or maybe you're constantly updating a server and you look at things and go, wow, we don't have to update every you know, one second, we can change it every minute. And that'll give us enough data, enough latency because we're noticing that our users are using our app longer, or they're, they're in the OS, and we're performing some background tasks. So if we go here into the preferences, go ahead and show this here. So we can go ahead here and select this, uh, select data points. And this is going to give us all the different sensors we have. So on the power sensors here, you'll be able to see we've got the ambient light, um, all these different ones here for the audio and then if we drill down we've got the bat overall battery power so this would be just like hooking up a, a third party piece of hardware to a device and I'm monitoring the overall draw of the system <coughs> and then we can dig into each of the camera features and then we've got the display as well as the CPU and the internal EMC power uh, the RAM, we've got HDMI on here as well. So really, you know, I don't want to focus in on the app so much on the test points. There's a lot of information there. And if you download the app and play with it, um, you'll be able to find those test points. But this power setting right here, you're not going to get on a commercial device. Because again... Can you go find your brain into the CPU? Um, so you'll be able to look at like the frequency, the interrupts, the online state, the idle state. Um, I'll just scroll down to the bottom here. So the IO8, the load nice user system. So you'll be able to drill into all these different features of the, the different processors. And again, it's a dual core, so you'll see everything for CPU 0, CPU 1, so you can monitor the different states. <coughs> so, yes? Can you power the battery with the commercial? Right. So, so for the power, it has to have the dedicated hardware on the device. Without that, you're not going to be able to read any settings. So that, 
The other stuff will work, yeah. So you'll be able to get the CPU load and some other things. If I were to integrate this into some custom hardware my own, would I be able to support this really over? So that's an interesting question. So right now, um, you wouldn't be able to port this over to your custom hardware. Um, we are working towards a new architecture in the long term to where an app like this, as you see it now, it runs on existing hardware. You can use it, but you won't get the power readings. But there are ways that you can, um, in the future, hopefully, to be able to take that, add your own ADC, set up your own readings, and be able to monitor that same performance. So and one of the neat things, too, with this is the overlay. So you can bounce out of your application. You can see through your entire state as you're using it what's happening with the entire system. So I think that you know, really the, the message here is that once you add and modify all of your different changes to the stack, you want to make sure you have a degraded performance. You want to maintain that high level. Because right now, users are accustomed to taking their device and plugging in every night. Right? You want to make sure that it can last that entire day. Some users have, you know, I know many people that have multiple batteries for their devices. You want to get away from that. You want to make sure that your system, your hardware, can last as long as possible. And you're not doing anything in your software to limit that ability. So I think what we're going to do now is move on to the next step, unless there's any more questions on that. So there's various other tools that are out there um, that we have on developer.qualcom.com, such as the Adreno Profiler. Now the reason I bring this up again is it's all about making sure that your hardware modifications, if you're using the Snapdragon system on chip, that you're maintaining that high performance. So you're going to be able to take an existing game that you have, you can download it, you can profile it, and you can make sure that you're getting that exact same frame rate. So you're going to want to use this to, from an application development point, if you're doing OpenGL AES, uh, graphics implementation, but more from a hardware development point, you want to make sure that when you add these different components and you build your own devices and you use the Snapdragon uh, chip with the Adreno GPU, you maintain that high level of performance and you'll be able to monitor that all. So a little bit of information on the GPU. Um, it has a hierarchy from the gaming console. Uh, it's very optimized for mobile and it'll provide hours of gameplay. It's powering uh, most uh, all the Android phones that are um, Qualcomm chips as well as Windows Phone gaming experiences. So just a little background on that. And now talking a little bit about the hardware on the underlying layer. So the Snapdragon system on chip. So this looks a little confusing here, and let's just kind of break it down and make sure it's a little simplified. So dual core system, it's the um, Scorpion CPU. And let's just assume that the thread's been split in a way where you've got all your game logic running on one core and all of your rendering and different um, audio effects on the other core. So what's going to happen here is your application is going to start up, it's going to set up all your memory, um, talk through to some uh, memory on the system, run through some game logic, update all that information, and pass it off to the uh, Adreno GPU, which is going to pull in the textures, render all its different memory information. But one of the things that I really want to point out here is uh, this Venom loading point unit. So that is... Um, the <coughs> Snapdragon um, Qualcomm's implementation of the ARM7 Neon SIMD instruction set. So anything you're doing any vector graphics or uh, vector calculations, if you're using Android NDK, you probably don't know this, but it's turned on by default. So you're getting already this hardware acceleration just by building your application. So I want to point it out because some people, when they turn on that Neon instruction set, sometimes they say, wait a minute, I'm getting the same performance, I'm not getting that big gain. So what you would do in that state is you would go in and dive into the actual assembly code and you would just hand make some modifications and you'll see extremely beneficial performance. So that's one way that you can go ahead and take an existing app. You can go ahead, build in, look at the Neon instruction set and really take it further. Now, kind of along the line of the Neon instruction set, um, Venom, is the fast CV, uh, Computer Vision SDK. So this is going to provide you with the APIs that are most commonly used. So you can do uh, gesture recognition, uh, face recognition, um, augmented reality is also built on top of this type of engine. And really it's a way to tune your app just by the nature of using it. Right? So it's already uh, hardware uh, optimized. So if you look at this uh, SDK and you run it on a regular ARM uh, chip, it's going to all run in the CPU. So it's one SDK that runs across platforms. But when you run it on a Snapdragon, it's going to have that acceleration. So it's already going to be handled to optimize for the uh, Neon instruction set, for the DSP, for the audio processing, uh, for Adreno, for the graphics. So it's an entire 
package. So again, when you're building your hardware, you'll be able to take an application written for this and you can benchmark it, make sure that you're not, again, degrading performance in any way. And as uh, an extra layer here, oops, there we go. Um, so as the Kronos group evolves and creates a standard around computer vision for the API, you'll see right now there's a hardware abstraction layer. Um, and then there's a hardware uh, vendor implementation. We've got the open source reference implementation for the ARM set. So as this evolves, you'll be able to have the same optimization on multiple different hardware specifications. So you can take that hardware accelerated API and it'll run on all of these other chipsets. And it's one way that the fast CV engine right now can plug right into this framework and help drive the evolution. So, any questions on that? You know, I'm going through these SDKs real quick because I think we're looking at it from a hardware level and we really want to make sure that whatever we change, we don't incur any extras. So, on AR, um, this is another SDK that you can have to run on your devices that is really already optimized for systems. Now, the augmented reality, I think everyone's pretty familiar with that, right? It's just an extension of a computer vision overlaying something on the physical world that doesn't exist using the camera as a looking lens. It's already been optimized for the Snapdragon chipset for the Neon Co processor. And <coughs> just at a high level, you have these different image targets. They get downloaded, built into the resources, and get thrown into your application. Now, one of the great things about the AR application is it runs on multiple platforms. It's not tied to a specific chipset. So you can take any apps, you can profile it, you can make sure they run uh, extremely well on your hardware. It'll run on iOS, it runs on Android with the Unity 3 extension. And it gives you this extra way to have these tuned features already available for you to use. Uh, there's samples for all of these different SDKs. Um, and you can go ahead and use them, op optimize them, make them, use them in an optimized way as they already are. Uh, and create new types of applications. So the last thing that I kind of want to talk about here is AllJoin. And this is another software solution, and I think a way that you can really differentiate across your different hardware configurations. So one of the big things with these short-range radios that we have, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, is right here, right now, how do all of our devices communicate? How do they do that efficiently? So why can't they find them around me right now? The reason for that, oh, sorry, so AllJoin is an open source framework that creates an ad hoc peer-to-peer -peer and it's proximity based in the nature that it's using Wi-Fi and it's using Bluetooth and those radios have defined ranges associated with them. So it's going to allow these multiple device interactions. So if you're building hardware for a TV, you want it to interact with a mobile device, uh, you have the ability to use this framework to have that communication and have it managed for you so you get to focus on the, on the app design or at your hardware design level, if you're having your OSs instantly communicate and sync between different technologies. So peer-to-peer -peer is difficult. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to use a peer-to-peer -peer system. Um, there's multiple different factors you have to account for. There's the different radios, there's different platforms. So you could be running you know, one version of Android, talking to another version of Android, or even communicating with the Linux environment, having them all communicate, handling all the data marshalling, and then using security. So you don't have to be a security expert. Um, you can just use the existing framework, set up your communications. And the other part is uh, discovering the devices around you. So right now, how would all of our devices interact? How do they do it efficiently? So that's what this SDK provides you the ability, is that it sits on top of these different wireless radios. And it's also an open source solution on alljoin.org. So you can download this, include it into your products. You can bake it into the Android OS, have the Bluetooth connectivity. Um, because it does require uh, running as a more trusted user. It, one of the things with all joint for Bluetooth is it doesn't require true device pairing. It uses a secure zero in the pairing, so that way you, you know, for the interaction, you won't have to enter the pin code. So it could be that you've built out an entire TV system and you want it to communicate maybe your device to be a remote control. So you can come into some environment, you can find those devices, you can then interact with them very easily over all joint um, without doing any additional setup, just having your local radios. So, um, just again to, to talk more about this, it's under the Apache 2.0 license. So you can include this into your existing technology. It makes it very easy to use. Um, and there's an entire Git project that you can become a member of. So that's one way to really, I feel, with the peer-to-peer, -peer, 
that you can start to gain a differentiated experience. So your devices can just start to interact between each other, and you can do it at the hardware level. Right? Where does security <coughs> have such a protocol that doesn't need any authentication to be able to control? So, so it allows you to discover the devices around you, and it's up to, it, it just provides you the framework. So what you would do if you wanted to have a secure environment for this type of application is you would set up security with AllJoin, and by doing that, you'd basically take your, your AllJoin annotation for your class, your remote methods that you're going to invoke, and you would just tell it that it's a secure method. And then you have three choices for authentication. You either have a pin code verification, much like Bluetooth, that's built into the, the AllJoin stack. You have a username and password, so it's like logging onto a remote server. And you can also do a certificate, so much like going to HTTPS and having a certificate authentication chain. So you'll be able to have the security built in. So you can create different situations where there could be kind of some security issues, um, such that maybe you're exposing a file system and you're, you're interacting with that. But most of these times, these devices are being set up and used in closed environments, right? Aldrin is all about solving a proximity-based solution. So on my home system, I'm communicating with my other devices, and maybe I have a certificate that I've created, and all my devices have that. So they're able to talk through through that technology. Maybe for a conference right now, we have some sort of conference application. And that, by the app developer, would have different requirements for security. right? So maybe it's, it's a login for some social network, um, and then we use Exchange uh, social IDs. So it's really just the framework for you to do anything you want peer-to-peer. -peer. You find the devices, and then you interact with them. So I, I I think I talked around your question a little bit. Well, so, well, that's okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, maybe, maybe we can follow up and have a, a longer discussion outside on the security aspect. All right, yes, sir? Um, so is the Altium framework primarily unicast peer-to-peer exchange, or is it error and everything built up from that link, or is there kind of a base external gas communication leveraging some of the capabilities that may be inherent in the underlying wireless? Yes. So, so it, it does use multicast, so I don't have the diagram there, but at an at a even higher level, what, what it's doing is it's establishing a virtual bus, or, sorry, a virtual bus. Um, it's using multicast on Wi-Fi to find the devices around you for its advertisements and discovery. And then once you've connected up, we have uh, a remote procedure call. It's a one-to-one -one interaction. But you can also send a signal, which is one-to-many. So you can have all your devices that are connected up on a session, um, all interacting together. And there's two different models that you can use. Um, you can have a session that's a multi-point session, which is kind of like Bluetooth where you have a master and slave topology, um, and it does support scatter nets for Bluetooth. So when you have that type of system, if the host leaves, then you know, the game kind of shuts down. But with AllJoin, you can also have a single one-to-one -one connection. Um, and on that, when you send a signal, once you have many connections, it'll kind of create a star diagram where everyone's connected to each other. You'll be able to interact with everybody on that system. So it's all how you choose to use all join. You can use the, the multi um, the uh, multi point session and have it efficient. That's kind of around gameplay. But like I was talking about for a conference app, you probably want to have some connections to each person that you want to interact with. And that way, as people leave and go in this ad hoc network, you don't break down in, you know on your communication. And it's all efficient. Yes, sir. Is there any other number of pairs that you know reliably is performing? So. We've seen with Bluetooth as you start to add more and more users into the chain. Um, so once you start supporting a scatterning type of topology, there is some performance breakdown, but that's inherent in the wireless technology. And then for Wi-Fi, you're limited by the number of people you can, and sockets you can open up on an access point. And then we've also had other talks for um, around gaming about being efficient with the traffic that you're sending over your access point or over your communications. And it could just be that a design change Maybe you've used Trepin, you've power profiled, and you've found that you know maybe we're having too much network chatter, or we're updating our player position too frequently. Then you can start to look at your architecture and say, wow, it would make more sense to do it this way, and kind of flip up the design to where instead of updating your player position every um, couple of frames, you're updating it a little bit less frequently. And that's taking off. Yeah, so on, on Wi-Fi, you're limited to just the number of connections you have on the access points to so the upper bound. Um, of that, and then if you have a um, a subnet, then you can have multiple connections. So the, you know the upper bound is really you're, what you're limited on the technology. So for Bluetooth, um, we start to see performance breakdown 
at about uh, eight devices once you start to reach the threshold of the scatter net then. Depending on your app though. So if you're doing a simple chat app, you can still get by with, with the performance that's there, maybe having 16 devices or so. But once you, if you're having a player position updated over Bluetooth and it's propagating through from these different multiple hosts, you're going to see some performance degradation. You're going to have to look and analyze what you're doing in your game or your application. Right, so with Wi-Fi Direct, um, it's going to require some uh, OS integration in order to have that ability because of the permissions issue, much like Bluetooth for the device pairing. But what we're going to see is that with Wi-Fi, the situation is if we're on opposite sides of an access point on the fringe, we're not going to be able to communicate, and Wi-Fi Direct won't solve that. But if we're both together, kind of on the fringe of the network, then our devices should talk together. And it's going to be the exact same concept with uh, Bluetooth, where it's going to have that master-slave topology. And the great thing is, since all join is this software framework that sits on top of these radios, once you start using it, when that technology evolves and we update the SDK, your, your existing technology won't change. So if you build it into your OS, you have some sort of new connected experience where maybe you're able to uh, take a photo and send that photo out to all the people around you. You've built it into the native application. Then for Wi-Fi Direct, once that's evolved and it's there, you want to change anything. So you can build it now, prototype, and as new technologies come out, take advantage of those new radios. So Flashlink would be another one, you know, in the long-term future for another short-range radio um, and all sorts of other new technologies that come about. So uh, I think that's it. If you want more information, um, you can purchase the devices through B-Square. Again, not really trying to sell it, but they're the boards. Um, you can go to developer.qualcom.com, download the SDKs that I briefly talked about, um, find more information, and then, um, yeah. Thank you all for your time. Um, it's been a pleasure presenting for you.